Welcome to the Dinosaur George podcast, a show about paleontology and other earth sciences. Dinosaur George is a public speaker, author, and TV host with 30 years of study in paleontology. He has performed live in over 4,500 events across the US and Canada. Now, here is Dinosaur George. Hey there, everybody. It is September 10th, 2019. Things are going great. You're listening to podcast number 148. Great news. Uh, Possibly this summer, our traveling dinosaur museum will be traveling to New York. And I don't want to disclose the name of the city and museum yet because it may not come to fruition, but... I just want to give everybody a heads up that it looks like we'll be taking it on the road this summer. One of our first stops appears to be in Louisiana. And then from there, we're heading up uh, some interstates into New York. So let me say this. If you live in a community that's along this particular route, uh, contact your city and find out if maybe your chamber of commerce or maybe you have a museum that has a a facility we'd love to stop make some stops along the way so we're going to be traveling out i-10 into louisiana and then going up i-59 i-75 i-40 i-81 and then ultimately i-78 And what we're looking to do is we're looking to try to find another two or three stops along the way in your city So if you uh, live along that route that goes from Louisiana all the way up to New York, and we pass through a lot of different cities, uh, states, if your state is there and you'd like to see our traveling museum, this would be a great opportunity for us to get to meet you and you forget you you get a chance to meet with us. And uh, so anyway, details about it, we're, we're still putting it together. It's still early, but if you do have somebody that you think might be interested in being a part of it contact us at our email address which is booking b-o-o-k-i-n-g at dinogeorge.com that's booking at dinogeorge d-i-n-o-g-e-o-r-g-e.com booking at dinogeorge.com send us uh send us information if or have somebody contact us if you think they might be interested in doing it it would be a great opportunity and I would absolutely love to stop at um, love to stop at states along the way. Other than that, man, we've been busy. It's been crazy busy. My schedule is getting ready to explode with the traveling museum. I'm able to get back out now on the road, which I'm really looking forward to. I've missed it a lot, and um, love bringing dinosaurs to people, especially into those communities where maybe the the children haven't had a chance to. Uh, Hadn't had a chance to to see dinosaur bones. While I was skulking around on the internet, I find out about this symposium that's being held this weekend, September 14th and 15th, 2019. It's being held at the Dickinson Museum, which is in Dickinson, North Dakota. If you live anywhere up in that area, it sounds like it's really going to be an, an interesting uh, symposium. It's called Cretaceous and Beyond. And it has, it's focusing on the paleontology of the Western interior. So um, what I did is I found out who two of the main hosts were, and that was um, uh, Dr. Denver Fowler and then his wife, Dr. Elizabeth Friedman Fowler. And I've got an interview scheduled with them later on this morning. So once I've had a chance to get their interview We'll put it all together and get this podcast out ASAP so that for those of you that may be able to attend can attend. So listen, when I come back, we're going to jump right into that. uh, We're going to jump right into that podcast. So I mean, the podcast, that interview with Dr. Fowler. So uh, let's take a break and we'll be right back. Okay. Dinosaur George's traveling exhibit to your school, museum, or city. This is the largest exhibit of its kind in North America and will turn any facility into a natural history museum. You'll see things like prehistoric mammals, giant fish, ancient reptiles, and of course, dinosaurs. It's affordable, amazing, and will be an event you'll never forget. See complete details at dinosaurgeorge.com or call us toll free, 888-487-7478. Bring Dinosaur George's Traveling Museum to your community today. 
In Dickinson, North Dakota is the Dickinson Museum Center. And part of that museum center is the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. Now, that museum houses some of the largest or one of the largest collection, if not the largest collection of real dinosaur fossils on display anywhere in North Dakota. It includes uh, complete triceratops skulls, uh, complete dinosaur skeletons, hundreds of fossils and a mineral collection and some hands on activities. Well, with us today is the curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum, Dr. Denver Fowler, and from Dickinson State University, paleontologist Dr. Elizabeth Friedman Fowler, to tell us a little bit about the museum and most importantly, their upcoming symposium. So, Dr. Fowler, welcome to the show. All right. Thanks for having us. So, what a coincidence that you both have the same last name. How odd is that? <laughs> Yeah, I was few of those at the uh, paleontology meeting. <laughs> well, what I'd like to do, uh, if if and and first, uh, to all the listeners, everybody understands when you are speaking to someone who's gone through college and gotten their degree and their title is doctor, it is proper to refer to them as doctor. But in the case of having uh, Doctor Elizabeth and uh, Doctor um, Denver. Would you guys mind if I called you just by your first names? Would that be okay? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely fine, yeah. Okay, that's great. Well, thank but you. You bet. Well, it's very important because it's it's frustrating for me when you see a young person, see somebody like you guys on TV or hear, like, hear you on a podcast, and they come up and call you by your first name. It's just inappropriate until they find out if that's acceptable to you. You may feel completely comfortable, but I want the listeners to understand how hard it is to get your degree, how much work you had to do to get it. So it is a, it is a matter of respect to refer to both of you as doctor. But in this particular one, I'm going to be calling you Elizabeth and Denver. So, so let's start with, uh, let, well, let's start with, with Elizabeth, Dr. Elizabeth. Tell us a little bit about yourself first. Well, I'm originally from Florida and I always loved dinosaurs as a kid. Um, for as long as I can remember, um, but there's no dinosaurs in Florida. So I, you know, big up shark teeth and mammal bones from the Pleistocene, but of course wanted dinosaurs. Uh, then I did my college at uh, Franklin Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And every summer I went out with Jack Horner's crew from the Museum of the Rockies. So every summer I went out and uh, dinosaurs in Montana uh, throughout my undergrad. And then when it was time for grad school, uh, Jack took me on as a PhD student. Man, well, Florida is is amazing, like you said, for Pleistocene mammals, some great stuff. And let me ask you, were there dinosaurs living in what is now Florida and just that layer is not accessible? Or do you think there were no dinosaurs in that area when, when during the Mesozoic? Uh, for the most part, during the Mesozoic, Florida was still underwater. So there wasn't land for the dinosaurs to be on. Um and so some marine sediments were deposited in what is now Florida during the Cretaceous, but they've been covered by so many more recent layers from Cenozoic sediments that most of what we have exposed in Florida is things like Miocene, uh, Pliocene, Pleistocene, you know, much more fairly recent material, again, very often marine because Florida was so often covered by high sea levels. Um, there is one Cretaceous fossil from Florida that they were drilling a well core, and in that core they pulled up a fragment of turtle shell from the Cretaceous. So that's all they've got. Well, but you know what? You're on the map. That's all that matters, right? <laughs> Maybe your problem is instead of going to the Dakotas to dig up dinosaurs, you should have taken the hard route and just invested in a backhoe okay. and just started digging incredibly deep holes. You could... You know, you could that could really be something there. You should think about that. <laughs> yeah. Does that be good if you have a lot of money and a lot of drills? <laughs> yeah. It's going to be wet. <laughs> well, but you know what? I learned something new that that is you had a Cretaceous turtle. So that, that had to be exciting to, for you to learn about that, though, right? Yeah. I thought that was a, a fun little fact I read in the, the book on Florida fossils. Now, do you specialize in anything in particular? Like, do you 
do you have a focus on hadrosaurs or or do you just study any of the dinosaurs from the from the badlands uh, i lean towards hadrosaurs so that's my all of my dissertation was on uh describing some new hadrosaur species from the judith river formation of montana so i've spent most of my time in the late cretaceous uh, of the montana region so that's the fauna that I'm most familiar with. So I focus mainly on the hadrosaurs, but I also like to look at microfossils, vertebrate microfossils, so things like amphibian jaws and fish vertebrae, um, looking at the whole ecosystem picture and what that can tell us about the environment that the dinosaurs are living in. That's so that that's really neat. And you're with Dickinson State University. Do you teach there or are you just associated with them? as going out into the field and doing research for them? Uh, I'm an assistant professor of biology at Dickinson State. So mainly I teach the human anatomy course, which is exactly what we did as graduate students at Montana State University. It's even the same textbook. Um, So that's really fun. And then sometimes I'll pick up some other biology or geology labs as needed. Right. So how did you end up with the same last name as Denver, is it just your coincidence that worked out that way? No, we met uh, many years ago at a paleontology conference at CP meetings. Uh, we also have a ton of friends in common. Paleo is a very small world. Right. Well, we've been there seven years. I can't remember how long it is. It's something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look, you you two are used to dealing in millions of years. How could you possibly expect to remember something as as futile as your wedding date, right? I mean, you've got other priorities. Exactly. Like, honestly, I remember it by which field season it came after. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're the only person that received wedding gifts that involved hammers, plaster. Uh, <laughs> yep. So, we really did. Yeah, we really did. We got a few super picks, paleo Yeah, picks. our wedding registry was, was you know, cordless drills and uh, paleo picks, rock hammers, big chisels. <laughs> it was a fun list. What a great... Dissection books. <laughs> yeah, the dissection books. I don't know about that. That's so great. <laughs> That's so great, though. Well, that is just, that's just absolutely perfect. Yeah, that we is... already had plates and towels. I wanted more rock cameras. <laughs> <laughs> that, oh, that's brilliant. Okay, so Denver. Now, with your accent, clearly you're from South America, right? <laughs> yeah. Even back home, they can't figure out where I'm from these days. But, um, I'm originally, originally from the north of England, uh, just outside of Manchester. And um, been a few places. I, I did my undergraduate at Durham, and then um, I did my master's degree at uh, the University of Bristol, uh, where Mike Benton is, of course. And uh, um, when I was living in England, I spent a lot of time uh, collecting dinosaur fossils and other fossils, especially on the Isle of Wight and the Cretaceous, the early Cretaceous of the Isle of Wight. So I collected a lot of iguanodon and baryonyx bits and stuff like that. And then um, I did my PhD under Jack Horner at the Museum of the Rockies um, up until 2016, and at which point I uh, started here in Dickinson. Let me ask you about baryonyx, just just off off to the side. Um, does have you ever found its teeth? Have you ever had a chance to study its teeth? And are they distinctively different enough that if you just looked at a tooth, you'd be able to tell its baryonyx? Um, I've collected most, and I don't, all of the baryonyx material I've collected for teeth. I know there's a few vertebrae and things like that have been found, especially recently, but I have, I don't know, 20 odd teeth I've collected of berries. Um, they're quite variable. Um, I did a poster about baryonyx teeth at SVP in 2007, I think, um, looking at how they vary. They are very distinct. Um, they usually have some kind of um, fluting or faceting on them. Um, the not always on both sides. Usually just on the lingual, the tongue side, uh, but sometimes on both sides and sometimes on neither side. Sometimes they're just like little flat facets. Other times they're deep grooves down the side of the teeth. They have finer serrations than is typical for theropod dinosaurs. Um, so that they're quite distinctive. They look very different from the other things that you find in the wheel of of uh, the early Cretaceous of, of, of Europe. 
Um, and they're supposed to, I've, I've not seen as many Spinosaurus seats. I've seen the ones that you see today, of course, and they have one here at the museum. Um, and they have no syringe. Um, the serrations have gone by that point, I, w- I would say. Um, but yeah, back I see the beautiful, beautiful things. I, they're, they're some of my favorite fossils. I always used to go looking for them in specific beds where they seem to be more common. So the dis- the distinction between them, because you described three very distinctive different individual sh- uh, uh, design to each tooth. Would that be based on the placement in the skull, like towards the front? Maybe you would find those with the with the more dramatic fluting, and then as you move back, is is it have to do with that, or is it just? Do you think it's just each individual had some variances? I expect it's probably position in the mouth. Um, um, I know there's been some jaws that have been found. They certainly have the lower jaw of the, of the type specimen of baryonyx. Um, and the teeth do change shape a little bit through the mouth. I mean, sometimes, yeah, they say that they're very crocodile-like, but they're conical. And sure, most of them are quite conical, but not all of them. Some of them are uh, more more laterally compressed than you might expect for a baryonyx, if you like. Um, so I suspect it's very much position in the mouth that... There would have been a set of teeth in the rostral area, the tip of the snout, for sort of grabbing a fish. And then you have like a little notch, which had some smaller teeth inside. There's some really big teeth on the edge of the notch, and then they got smaller towards the back. Um, and I expect that the variation in the fluting would, would be mouth position. Um, although I haven't looked at that in any great detail, but that's what I would expect. I, and I apologize pulling us off subject, but I'm just intrigued with baryonics find it to be fascinating, but so little information is available to the general public, me being included in the general public. You know, we hear and see what we see, but I, I just find that dinosaur fascinating. So when you said baryonyx, I almost jumped out of my chair. So, <laughs> so I, I, it's, it's my favorite dinosaur. Oh. I, I, yeah, it's, a, it's just one of those cool things that you find bits of every now and then. And it's, it's unique, you know, it's, it's so, it's so different from, from what we typically think of as a theropod dinosaur. It's uh, it was a real treat to find my first two. I just kept finding them. They're, they're, they're really cool things. Oh, have you ever had the chance to compare it to Suchomimus or Irritator or any of those other guys that, that are from what my understanding is, is that they're from the same group. Have you ever had a chance to look at some of those other ones to see how they compare or don't compare to Baryonyx? I haven't made any detailed comparisons with those, when I did my poster in 2007, I looked at a few teeth that were in the Natural History Museum in London that were a little bit older. Um, I think the Suchomimus material is ever so slightly younger than um, the Baryonyx material, stratigraphically younger. It's like a couple of million years younger, something like that. Right. Um, but from what I've seen, there's not that much difference. But I don't know quite how much Suchomimus material that actually is. Um, I mean, there's an awful lot of or teeth, I think. Yeah, they're just, they're just really cool. I mean, for me, I, I um, it's interesting to see where Baryonyx comes from and where it goes. I assume that it evolves into Spinosaurus, and Spinosaurus is a little bit stratigraphically younger. And it's interesting to see what it might have evolved from. Um, on the poster, um, we pointed out that there were some teeth that looked very similar to Baryonyca teeth that were originally found in Kendaguru as part of the uh, German expeditions. Um, they're late Jurassic, of course, uh, Tendaguru, Africa. Um, and they were figured in some of these old monographs, but no one really, they were called Ceratosaurus teeth, Ceratosaur teeth, um, because Ceratosaurus has similar flutes on the teeth that it has at the front of its jaws. Um, but I, I got hold of one of the monographs and I scanned the images in and zoomed in. You can see really fine serrations. They look more like Barry and Ike teeth. So I think some of the, those are primitive Barry and Ike teeth. So they were pretty cool to compare to. Oh. Um, and that, uh, it's quite interesting. At the same time, at the same conference, uh, Eric Buckthau had got in touch and said, you know, he, he came to the same conclusions looking at that, those uh, tender guru teeth. So he, he always, credit, he always um, cites my, um, my poster when he's talking about this stuff, which is, which is great. But, uh, nice. He came over there at exactly the same time. Ah, that's well, congratulations. That's, that's, that's cool. So I went to the museum website and by the way, for everybody, it is Dickinson museum I'll put a link to that on the, uh, 
podcast page. Um, and I was pretty impressed that listen, that museum is really nice just from the images that I saw. So tell me a little bit about the, uh, about the museum itself. Um, well, the museum um, was originally uh, created after the creation of um, Alice and Larry League. So Larry was a professor at DSU, and he built up a collection of fossils, and himself and his wife uh, were really into fossils and mineral collecting. Um, so they had this collection, and they put together a museum. And so the museum first opened, uh, the, the dinosaur side of the museum first opened in uh, 1992 or 93. Um, and it housed their collection, and they added to it over the years. Um, we also have an adjacent history museum, the Yoka Museum, which was opened from, I think, 1981. So they added onto the building and added this dinosaur museum. Um, so Larry Leake um, collected this nice triceratops skull that we have, Bill, and a number of other specimens and augmented that with some casts and all sorts of things. Um, and then in 2015, uh, Alice and Larry retired uh, down to Colorado, and the collection was um, handed over, uh, donated to the city of Dickinson, um, with the understanding that they would hire someone to look after the collection and to help build up the museum. Um, so they hired me in early 2016 to um, basically build up the museum, to, to, to start a new chapter in the, in, in the Dinosaur Museum. Um, so we renamed the museum Badlands Dinosaur Museum, and we've been doing lots of field work. We've been adding new exhibits and uh, collecting new specimens and working on some new research. Oh, now when you do field work, do you need or allow uh, adult volunteers to go with you? Do you, do you, do they get the chance to go out in the field? And I realize that can be a very touchy thing because, you know, untrained people can't necessarily go out and assist digging up a dinosaur. So not everybody can do that. But is there any opportunity for something like that for, for people to do with you? Uh, yeah, we do take volunteers. Uh, of course, the size of our crews depends on what we're doing that summer, how much funding we have, how the weather is, you know, right. it's a bit too muddy. To do. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we put together a crew of, of volunteers and most of them are, uh, paleontology students or people somehow affiliated with the world of paleo. But we do always have some that are just members of the general public who are interested. Um, and we teach them from scratch. We teach them everything. Uh, people do need to be very physically tough. We live in extremely rustic conditions. We're, we're camping in a field. We have no luxuries of the modern world. Um, oh, well, we got a little generator this year. That was our luxury. Yes, we added a generator a and, and a tent for the crew to eat dinner in. So yeah, but we don't have any yeah. immediate really. Yeah. Wow. So it's, it's very, very basic camping um, and hiking around. You know, people just need to be used to being outdoors in all sorts of, of weather. And uh, if you're strong and can lift heavy things, we always like that as well. Yeah, that's pretty really welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet. I <laughs> bet. So, yeah, uh, we, we do ask you know, new people to come out for generally at least three weeks because it takes time to train people up and for people to get in the groove of things and really start knowing how to dig and what they're looking for and starting to get good at it. So just a week or two is not really long enough to fully develop the skills and be able to, you know, enjoy it productively. Right. Uh, so we like people to come out for longer periods of time. Yeah, yeah we train from scratch yeah, every we, year. We have, we have people come out from all, all walks of life. We have people who are sort of in between things. As yeah. A guy who came out who just, just left uh, one of the armed forces, and uh, he always wanted to dig up dinosaurs, so he came out and dig up dinosaurs with us all summer. Yeah. And we were in a long field season. We I think we did nine weeks this year, maybe ten weeks. Yeah, wow. so young, old. You know, I mean, at least 18 for legal purposes. Sure. Yeah. But, yeah, any age, as long as you're fit and, you know, good, optimistic attitude. Well, that's it's fun. So what, what you find in the field, you're able to either, does it all go back to the museum? Is the museum funding it or is the, the college involved as well? Is it sort of a joint operation between the two of you? My, my, my point being, or my question being, when you find something... Is it 
going to be displayed in the museum or would it be sent to the university for teaching or both? Uh, everything is run through the museum. So all of right. the, the funding, the operations, uh, I do it just mostly volunteer actually. Sure. Uh, in this, but yes, all the thoughts will come back to the museum here. Uh, it recently, the museum recently got um, accreditation as a federal repository, so BLM assessments can be permanently housed here. So we must nice. dig on uh, BLM, Bureau of Land Management, uh, federal land, and all those fossils come back here, and they will be taken care of forever. Yeah, yeah. Oh. so we got, we got a bunch of nice cabinets in, and we've, uh, it, was, it was a big deal for us to get the repository status, because we've been, since I got here, we've been working on upgrading some of the behind-the-scenes facilities as well. And so we've got a few new upgrades to the lab and our fossil storage. So it's great because it means, you know, what we get comes here to Dickinson and we can build displays and we can build our research collection. Now, is there a way that the public can donate to you guys? Is there is there a funding mechanism where they do they contact the museum if they want to donate? How, how can we get hopefully get some funding to you to, so you can continue doing this? Um, well, we have um, we have a funding uh, page on our website, um, which is a membership and donations, and that's the easiest way. That's a PayPal form. Um, we have different levels of museum membership, um, and then we have a number of individual projects, whether it's uh, exhibits or lab work or the field work. I mean, um, the city we have an operating budget, you know, so it pays to keep the lights on. But when we want to do anything like a, a bigger new exhibit or especially the field work, uh, we have to pursue private funding for that. So any donations for that side of things uh, is very much appreciated. Um, and like I say, there's a, there's a form on the website. If you just go to DickinsonMuseumCenter.com, then there's a, a membership slash donations tab at the top, which has a PayPal form. Yeah, and there's a lot of information on the website as well. If you go into the uh, dinosaur section, about the Dinosaur Museum, talk about our fieldwork program and, you know, different goals that we have for expanding the lab and collections, um, different projects people can sponsor. And if you're interested in any more details and some of these uh, higher level sponsorships, um, just please email Denver, uh, denver.fowler at dickinsongov.com. Yeah. So, it's, uh, I'll tell you one project that we're, we're fundraising for right now is we need a big helicopter because we have an articulated tyrannosaur skeleton that no, we're trying to get out. No. And it, it is beautiful. It is beautiful. You're it's, it's, kidding. It's pistatonic. It's, we've got its tail. It's in a really hard concretion, but that means the preservation is fantastic. But uh, that's what we're fundraising for right now. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> gosh. That's exciting. Oh, it is. We've 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 been digging out the site for a couple of years now, and it is fully ready for the helicopter to lift it. We just need to get enough money together for the uh, the heavy lifting helicopter. It's, it's a bit over 8,000 pounds, and we got that down. We originally thought it was going to be like 20,000 pounds. We trimmed it severely, uh, but it still needs a Blackhawk or a Chinook or a Sky Crane. Right. It's in a very hard concretion. And very dense drop, very heavy. The same concretion nearby has yielded a skin impression of duckbills, so visibly. Oh. Um, so we're hopeful. We're hopeful that maybe the transfer might have a chance of that kind of preservation too. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a bit, maybe it's not a long shot, but uh, it's articulated. It's in matrix that we know preserves skin. So. Oh we're, my gosh. We're hopeful. We're hopeful. Are you. Are, <laughs> we'll are you are you at liberty to, to tell us the total amount that you're looking for now? Do you know what that is? Can you share that now? Or is that something that people could just contact you directly to get? Uh, the helicopter quote we're working with right now is 50000 That's five zero fifty thousand. Right. Um, so we have a, a bit of grant money. We have a little bit from the field work budget, uh, a little bit from our uh, the nonprofit board that supervises the museum. But, yeah, we still need several tens of thousands of dollars to help get it out of the field. So, that, um, so anything people can do to help, certainly appreciate it. Right. And and so the reason for the helicopter is you're unable to get a, a heavy enough vehicle back there 
and be able right. to lift it up anyway. Exactly. You, even if you could get the vehicle back, lifting it up from the ground onto the truck is not, I'm, I'm from your description, has got to be something difficult. So with this helicopter, yeah, yeah. you would be lifting up the pieces and ultimately getting them transported to your museum, and then you'd begin to do the prep work there at the museum. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. The, the helicopter is just to lift it a couple miles to our flatbed truck. Right. So... The, the fossils in the middle of the badlands, the valley, there's just hills, and there's no roads. Yeah, you kind of you're not allowed to get a full wheel of that anyway. It's, it's um it's public land because we can't we can't get a, a vehicle to it. It's literally in this bowl shaped depression yeah. surrounded by yeah, it's but you can't even get a four wheel of that. So it's um wow. yeah, and we've asked you know just getting some heavy machinery and flattening the earth and building a road, it would cost as much as a helicopter. Sure. So sure. better to not destroy the land. Right. Well, have have you thought of and would the museum allow for you to do like a GoFundMe where more people would un, would know about it? Because one of the benefits of a GoFundMe or any sort of thing like that is that it gets in front of so many more people that they become aware of it. Is that something you would consider doing? Is it something you have do or have going now? Um, we've certainly thought about that. Um, I mean, until relatively recently, uh, well, we're working on our fundraising uh, side. Um, the board has certainly did, they put together a brochure about some of our various projects, and we were thinking about doing a, uh, what's it called, social media funding? What's it called? Crowdfunding. Crowdfunding. Uh, crowdfunding. I've, got, I've actually got a few things that we would do as, like, you know, the prizes that you get for different donation levels. Yeah, um, that's a unique item. Yeah, some cool casts of things that we have and some other things. Um, we did, we haven't implemented that yet. Uh, so, yeah, we're trying to decide whether this is this helicopter project is the best project for that or if we want to save the Kickstarter for one of the other exciting things Denver has in the pipeline. Sure, sure. Well, whatever the case... When the public or when, when more of the public finds out, I mean, what could be more remarkable than to be a part of a flying Tyrannosaurus Rex? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, literally, you, you could call it the flying Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> I think people would love to donate anything to that just to say that they were a part of lift, airlifting this dinosaur from the Cretaceous to today. I mean, you're airlifting it from the past into modern time. It that could be huge. I'll tell you something. I will. Uh, I will do everything I can to send people to your your museum page. But if there's ever a time that you do something specifically for this one project, uh, make sure that I know what it is because I'll do everything I can to continue to promote it because I think that's spectacular. What a what a great. Who wouldn't want to help see a Tyrannosaurus Rex? get lifted off. And it would also help bring my blood pressure down. <laughs> that I could understand. years has been nothing but stress. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Denver Elizabeth called me earlier. This whole interview is just to try to raise money for that to get your blood pressure down. She's concerned. <laughs> this is just a big ruse. This was like one of those, what do they call those shows? Uh, an intervention. <laughs> yes, we need a Tyrannosaur intervention. <laughs> No, you need to help him. He has more that he wants to dig up next year. Well, listen. The one he wants to dig up next year is in a big cliff. Yeah, we have, we have, we have four Tyrannosaurus sites. Oh, um, right. no. And one one is this beautiful articulated one, which is ready to go. And the others are disarticulated and um, promising. Uh, two, of them, two of them at least have skull material. Um, one of them is very large. These, these, are, these are campanians, so they're in the Judith River Formation. Right. But one's a big bruiser of an animal. It's uh, it's a big Displeosaurus, big, big has an adult size. Um, and we're going to be digging that next year. At least we're going to do a preliminary um, excavation to see what there is of it. Right. Um, but we have a few bits of skull and some vertebrae and things already. Well, one of the concerns for the general public who may not be familiar with you've got you've got erosion and you have the weather and you have all the all the things against you when you find something 
because you can't just leave it in the ground year after year after year after year because you've got to do something to protect it. So there's a sense of urgency to assist you in getting these things out of the ground because once they're gone, they're lost to science. So. Yeah. I mean, we, um, we usually, we remove any visible bones from sites and we check over old sites to make sure nothing new is poking out. Right. You know, uh, so we minimize the effect that current and future weathering will have on sites. But ultimately Good. the best thing to do is get it all out. Um, you know, work your way around the furthest bones in the site, make sure you've got everything. Right. Um, so we tend to work over multiple years on single sites just to, uh, just so we, how do I put it, um, make sure we've got all the pieces. Like sometimes you can't really be sure until you get it back to the lab and see, to know what you've got. Right. Well, yes, yeah, so we always check on old sites, see if there's good. anything else. Good, good, good. Well, that's exciting, but I am just, I'm thrilled about your Tyrannosaur. And when we get done with this interview, I definitely want to talk more about it. Cause if there's anything I can do to send anybody in to assist, I'll, I'll, I'll do everything I can. So <laughs> the symposium now I had, I'd been skulking around the internet. I'm always looking for interesting things and, and things I find interesting. And I come across this thing called uh, Cretaceous and beyond. And that's a symposium you guys have coming up, but uh, one that both of you are involved in. So tell us about your symposium. Uh, well, it, it originated because you know, normally the uh, big paleontology conference in North America every year is the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting. And so it's huge. People come from around the world and there's over a thousand paleontologists there uh, just on vertebrate paleontology. But they like to do international meetings, and so every few years they hold it in some other country. And this year, the SCP meeting is going to be in Australia, which is a fantastic opportunity for people that have the time and money to take off their jobs and go to Australia. So I'm sure it's going to be an amazing meeting, but for those of us that don't have the time or money to go all the way to Australia, um, we wanted to provide an alternative. So so that there is still a vertebrate paleontology meeting in North America this year. And yes, we, you know, leaned it towards the Cretaceous. And, yeah, there was know, a, the last time this happened, um, there was a meeting in Utah called the Mid-Mesozoic. So we thought we could sort of uh, follow on that. So after the Mid-Mesozoic, you get the Cretaceous and then a little bit over the border. And that lines up with the sorts of the ages of the rocks that are exposed in this area. So we teamed up with North Dakota Geological Survey, and um, to produce this program and uh, field trips for the Cretaceous and beyond. So we've got Cretaceous field trips and we've got field trips uh, just after the KT boundary here in North Dakota. Now, is this something that the general public can also participate or is this a symposium that brings in those paleontologists where you're able to compare notes and talk about new discoveries? Is, is, what, is, it, is it a public event? Um, well, it's it's open to the public. I mean, it's a research symposium, so this is primary research that's being presented, and, you know, the level of the presentations is to another researcher. But obviously, there's a lot of people who are really excited, interested about dinosaurs, fossils in general, and anyone can register and come along to the symposium. Um, so we have on-site registration um, on Saturday morning, and that's like 60 bucks. It's, uh, yeah. We've kept it all very affordable because DSU are very kindly... Uh, let us use their facilities where Liz teaches. Right, so we'll be doing it at Dickinson State University in the uh, Science Department Lecture Hall. Um, so that's where the talks will be. And like Amber said, these are full research-level academic talks where you know paleontologists are talking about their latest research to other paleontologists. But anyone is welcome to come. So we do have some, some local uh, community members that are going to be attending the talks just because they're interested. And yeah, we have a public event as part of the programming too. So on Saturday from 4 to 6 p.m., there'll be a panel of a select few people from uh, researchers from the conference, including myself and Liz, and we'll be uh, presenting a little bit about research and also just answering questions from the public um, um, about, well, anything, anything they've come yeah. up with. Right. So we'll, we'll have some, uh, some dinosaur experts, some mammal experts, 
experts, some marine reptile experts um, kind of covering the local area. And that's open to, that one's free and open to the public. Uh, it's 4 to 6 p.m. on Saturday, um, September 14th um, at Dickinson State University. And so, you know, we've got a lot of uh, local people coming. I know there's some kids coming from Bismarck. Uh, some of my students are bringing their families. Um, hoping to get a, a good crowd of you know, just people that are interested and we're going to have 60 paleontologists there if they can pick the brains of all of us and wow. just get any anything answered that they're curious about. Wow. So the the date of the event, two dates, is this coming Saturday and Sunday, right? The 14th and 15th, is that right? Yes, that's the date uh, of the talk. Right. And poster presentations yeah right and all the information or there's plenty of information including uh online registry uh registration through the dickinson museum center.com uh website you've got all the details about it there so if somebody is in or around or has access to get to dickinson north dakota uh this saturday and sunday september 14th and 15th 2019 is a symposium called Cretaceous and Beyond. Uh, it is open. They're certainly doing a, a general public event the evening, Saturday the 14th, which is great. And then if you have a real in, in detailed or a real love of paleontology, you should sign up and try to go to this because when you hear these paleontologists speaking about their research, you sort of get access to the cutting edge information that sometimes takes years to trick trickle down to the average citizen so if you're a dino lover man that's the place to be to try to get up there and do that um guys i cannot tell you how much i appreciate this i'm thrilled for your your symposium i am going nuts over your flying t-rex um boy i i mean i'm just so thrilled for you guys i'm i'm happy that you found so many specimens and especially you know, everybody loves Tyrannosaurus Rex. It's such an important, iconic dinosaur that everybody, no matter where you travel, everybody knows T-Rex. So now the general public can kind of be a part of helping one make it from the ground into a museum and ultimately be prepped and articulated and or whatever happens with it. Um, you've got to keep me posted if you choose to do something exclusively for this or if you're going to save your... GoFundMe ideas for maybe some of the other projects. Please let us know. Uh, we we would love to hear back from you guys on this thing. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. Uh, All right. It's, it's an exciting project. Oh, it's got to be exciting. I mean, in fact, why don't you just give me the coordinates and I'll swing by and <laughs> check it out. Make, I, look, for 50K, I may hire a helicopter and go steal it from you if I can figure out where it is. <laughs> that might be worth it. <laughs> At least we know it's safe because yes. it's really hard to get out of there. <laughs> yeah. We have to use rock tools to, to deal with the concretion itself. This thing's a, we used to call them chisel dances back where, when I was in England. Right. It, it, very little can affect that rock. Man, how hard do you have any idea how long it'll take you to, to prep him to get him out of the, out of the rock? Uh, that could be a multi-year project. Yeah. Like yeah. But we have a public viewing lab, which is where it would be prepared. Um, you know, before we've got the tail, the, the edge of the tail is off the block because it came out of the main concretion and went back in. So we have the tail section already here. The um, but we were worried that the block would be too big to fit through the doors into our lab. But it's just, like, we've got a couple of inches grace either side and it will fit through the doors. So we know we can get it into our lab now. Nice. But, uh, it was, it was going to be pretty tight. Well, from Dickinson State University, that is Dr. Elizabeth Friedman Fowler. And from the Badlands Dinosaur Museum, the curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum, Dr. Denver Fowler. Dr. Fowler, thank you guys both so much for taking time out of your schedule. I know you're busy and I know you've got a lot coming up this weekend. Good luck on your on your uh, symposium and absolute best of luck on your on your other uh, excavation ventures. Well, thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. It was nice talking to you. Oh, man, I am psyched about that Tyrannosaurus project. I sure appreciate both Dr. Fowler's coming on and giving us information. 
And man, that was exciting. That was really exciting to hear about that Tyrannosaurus Rex project. I wish my schedule allowed it. I would also get up there and I would go to that symposium. And I would encourage anybody who can get up there to go because that's going to be a lot of fun. All right, when I come back, I'm going to answer a couple of questions from our Ask Dinosaur George segment. So stick around. It's time to Ask Dinosaur George. In this segment, George answers your questions about paleontology. If you would like to leave a voice message, call us at 210-888-9077. This is not a toll-free call, so children, please ask your parents permission. If you would like to submit your question in writing, go to dinosaurgeorge.com and click the Ask Dinosaur George page. Questions are chosen at random and we clear all messages monthly. So if you have a question about paleontology, ask Dinosaur George. All right, I'm going to answer a couple of questions that were submitted through our Dinosaur George Facebook page. That's the Dinosaur.George Facebook page. All right, let's go. This is from Craig. Says, do you think that the top jaw notch on Dilophosaurus between the maxilla and premaxilla is an example of convergent evolution and served a similar purpose to the jaw notch seen in Spinosaurids like Baryonyx? Could we determine information from what we know about Spinosaurids and apply them to Dilophosaurus? What a brilliant question, Craig. Okay, for those of you that may not understand, convergent evolution is where you have two non-related animals who both have similar features. For instance, a giraffe and a brachiosaurus. They both have incredibly long necks. Those two animals are not related, and yet... They have a similarity. So that's what convergent evolution is. That is where two different animals arrive at the same thing because whatever that thing is, is an effective tool. So in my opinion, yes, Dilophosaurus has that hooked upper jaw, that notched upper jaw, because it was very effective for catching fish. And more and more evidence is suggesting Dilophosaurus is a pescivore eating fish. Now, we also see it in animals like Smilosuchus, or like some of the crocodilians. So again, those animals also are very distinctively different, especially Smilosuchus and a Dimetrodon. Dimetrodon has it, Smilosuchus has it, Dilophosaurus has it, Baryonyx has it, Spinosaurus has it. Maybe Suchomimus too, and maybe Irritator. I don't know if those two do, but I think they do as well. I don't know if enough, I don't know if enough evidence has been found to, to prove that, but my guess would be they probably do. So those animals, Dilophosaurus and Baryonyx, are not very closely related, but in my opinion, both came up with the same evolutionary trait because it was an effective tool and it was passed down through the generations. If it's effective, usually you pass that on to the next in line. So I believe that, yes, they are not. They are not closely related. That's why they both have it. They have it because it's a very effective tool to help them survive. All right, my buddy David, if you lived in the age of the Flintstones, what would you have as a pet? And especially one you'd use for your daily drive, something that you could ride to and from work, but it doesn't live inside the house. (laughs) David, this is a fun question, actually. All right, so what would I have? Well, I would probably go with some sort of an ankylosaur for a couple of reasons. One, they would never run off. I mean, you wouldn't lose control and it would take off running like it would, like if you were riding on the back of a, say, a... a, um, uh, Ceratopsian or a Hadrosaur, those two guys could probably move pretty quick. So my, I would want to use an Ankylosaur. And in the traffic jam, he just lowers his head and pushes and pushes everybody out of the way. So if I were living with Fred and Barney and William, Wilma and uh, who else did I leave off? Fred, Barney, Wilma, Betty. How could I forget Betty? I had a crush on Betty. How, how could I forget Betty? Anyway, I would probably ride around on a on an ankylosaur. Maybe you have to build some sort of saddle that fits between all those armored spikes, but it would be fun. All right, uh, this is from Christopher. Uh, this is Mark and Stephanie's uh, child. Christopher, 11 years old. Christopher says, what is your second favorite dinosaur? Well, Christopher, as you know, my first favorite is Allosaurus. My second favorite has to be has to be Deinonychus. I love Deinonychus. I've always been impressed with that animal. I think it's totally cool. Uh, maybe, maybe 
it would be Utah Raptor. Maybe that would be my second favorite. They, maybe they're sort of equal at the second spot. But I love both of them. But but maybe Deinonychus would be more of my second favorite. Christopher, write back and tell me who your first and second favorite is. All right, finally, there is Strong from, uh, not from, uh, Strong. If dinosaurs could be brought back like in Jurassic Park, could they bring infectious diseases with them? I heard so, but I don't understand how. Strong, this is a, this is a, this is a very good question. I don't know enough about DNA to say with any certainty, but here's my understanding of it. DNA is the genetic recipe for making an individual animal. But within that genetic recipe is not the recipes for all of the diseases that that animal has. So, for instance, if I gave you a recipe to make a chocolate cake, hidden within that wouldn't be the recipe for salmonella. Does that make sense? So I don't know if they would bring back infectious diseases I just don't know how DNA works, but I do know that they would probably be incredibly susceptible to infectious diseases because they would probably have absolutely no, uh, no way of defending themselves against them. All right. Listen, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope that uh, uh, you will go to the website for the Dickinson Museum. And if you have the ability I hope you can donate a little money to them to help them uh, figure out how to get that T-Rex out of the ground. Take care of yourselves. Take care of the people around you. Be decent and kind. The world is full of so many good things. Don't get so tied up in all the negative, okay? Take care, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Dinosaur George Show. Please follow us on our social media links and join our mailing list. If you're interested in having Dinosaur George speak at your event, please visit our website at dinosaurgeorge.com. Until next time, keep digging for clues about the past.